Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to the online seminar on the mathematical foundations of data science. Thank you all for joining today. Oh. Our seminar is generously sponsored by Two Sigma. It's my great pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Sean Main from University of Florida. Professor Main is currently Professor and the Robert Pittman Eminent Scholar Chair in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Florida, the Director of the Labs for Cognition and Control, and Director of the Florida Institute for Sustainable Energy. Uh, he has made fundamental contributions in the areas include decision control, stochastic processes, and optimization. His research spans in both theoretical and applicational aspects. He is a fellow of the IEEE and a recipient of many prestigious awards for his academic contributions. His award-winning monograph with Richard Tweedy, Markov Chains and Stochastic Stability has been cited thousands of times in journals from a range of fields. The title of Professor Main's talk today is Quasi-Stochastic Approximation with Applications to Gradient-Free Optimization and Reinforced Learning. Please join me in welcoming him. Great. Thank you very much. So um, I was lazy, everybody. And, um, OK, great. Thank you. Can you hear me OK? Is, is, is the sound OK? Yeah, yes, yes. OK. So um, yes, 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 I was I right. I was, I was, a, I was a bit lazy. Or, or you can say I'm just going to be adaptive. Um, there was a, uh, a boot camp uh, for this uh, uh, fall program at Berkeley on reinforcement learning. And I gave a full day short course on the topic. And so the, the, basically what I have is um, here part three and um, part four of my uh, tutorial. But there, you know, these two, this was two hours, but there was an incredible amount of history and stuff. And rather than try to reshuffle this and make another lecture for you all, I'm just gonna adaptively go through this, okay? And, and leave out some of the, the long history, which you can, you can see online if you want. Um, so, 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 so basically what I'm gonna do now is in one slide tell you what stochastic approximation is, and then quasi-stochastic approximation will be obvious. And, um, and there's applications to gradient-free optimization, which come out basically based on Kiefer Wolfowitz ideas and ideas of SPAL. Um, there's some, and you know, I'll explain plots like this, you know. Um, we have some non-convex function, and I don't know its gradient, but I'd, I'd like to find this global minimum. And, um, and it's miraculous how this sort of quasi-stochastic approximation theory works to solve these problems. Now, there's some theory, you know, it depends on your appetite. I'm really excited about this. So let me tell you how this happened. I decided this summer to write a book on reinforcement learning. And also, I was getting ready for this short course at Berkeley. And I, I decided as, a, as sort of a challenge to try to write a book where the first half of the book does not mention the word probability once. I wanted to be able to give all the theory kind of concepts in a deterministic setting. So I set about writing a chapter on stochastic approximation without any randomness. And you know, and I, I kind of in the back of my mind, I thought maybe I could improve the theory. Well, it turns out it's so much easier than the stochastic case. And you can get really crisp bounds and rate of convergence. It's so much more accessible than the stochastic theory. So I'm really excited about this. So this, this book is now um, in progress. It will be published by Cambridge University Press next year. Um, and so from here, I will jump to give applications to um, just briefly policy gradient methods in RL. Okay, and this is joint work with a, a bunch of friends and former, former and present students. And I think Shuang Chen has been the biggest collaborator on the theory of all of this, but friends at NRL, which are, are shown here, and, um, and my, former, my former students at DT anyway. Okay, um, so what is stochastic approximation? So, some, uh, uh, so a bit of a, a shock to some of you, when I write papers and I send them to NeurIPS, you know, formerly NIPS, invariably I get a reviewer who screams at, at us because we're saying we're going to analyze Q learning using stochastic approximation. And many in computer science get angry about that. Now, this goes back to Tsitsiklis. Tsitsiklis. 
and Jordan separately. In 1994, you know, they pointed out that Q learning is a stochastic approximation algorithm, and, and, and so convergence can be analyzed using tools from stochastic approximation. But it seems to be that more than 50% of the CS community doesn't know that, and they get really pissed when you when you say that. So I'm trying to fight back right now. <laughs> Just basically stop rejecting my papers. <laughs> it's it is stochastic approximation, whether you like it or not. And it was pointed out by two rock stars. You know, it's Cyclist and Jordan, you know, are you know heroes. So um so stop yelling at me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so what is stochastic approximation? We have a a function which can be represented as an expectation. Okay, and we'd like to find a root of that function. So that's the goal of stochastic approximation. And the approach is sort of an ODE method. This is this is the way I like to think about it. So basically, you design. Basically, so there's a design element here. You know, you can basically you could multiply this by a matrix gain if you wanted. You can modify the function and so forth, and you do so so this ODE is stable. Okay. Um, and if it's stable, then the if theta t will converge to a root, so you've solved the problem, all right? Okay, now obviously you can't run this ODE because it involves taking expectations every microsecond. So what you do then is an Euler approximation, you know, um, so if I, or maybe something more fancy, you know, some Runga-Kuta technique, and you could do that, but still you've got a problem. Every, every instant, you would have to evaluate this expectation too expensive, okay? And so then Robinson Monroe comes to the rescue, uh, and, and what you do is you replace, you get rid of this, and you get this, all right? There's stochastic approximation. What's the big deal? And, you know, TD learning, Q learning, speedy Q learning, ERM, DQN, least grid value iteration. You give me a, a, a re reinforcement learning algorithm. I can put it in this framework. It is stochastic approximation. Stop yelling at me. <laughs> okay, I'm not being defensive. I'm just, I'm joking. Okay, it's just, uh, but it is funny. Um, the point is, everybody, the point is, Euler approximations are robust. Done. <laughs> so, you know, it's it's so easy to prove that this works. You know, under really minimal conditions, because Euler approximations, if you do things right, of course you need conditions. You know, just like for um, differential equations, you need this to be Lipschitz continuous. You need some control in the noise. You need some conditions on the gain. But it's really you can use the same techniques to analyze differential equations to show that stochastic approximation converges. You know, the difficulty is rates of convergence. That's that's where the analysis gets really difficult. But convergence, meh. It's nothing. And that, again, that was pointed out in context of RL by Johnson Siklis primarily, and, and then Jordan, it was almost a comment uh, in the same year. All right, so that's that. Um, and again, so I'm just repeating myself here again. Oral approximation is robust. So, um, I'm, so I'm not gonna get into too much about it, um, but, um, but I, I just wanna emphasize this, that um, in algorithm design, we're going to design the dynamics so we get convergence. That's number one. Okay, this is the way I think it should be taught. You know that that basically there's a lot of work that goes on into designing f, which then gives you f bar, and uh, sort of like, well, I'll give examples in a moment. And uh, and well, yeah, here's here's a. Here's one example. You might have to modify the dynamics, and here's one example. You can go and say, I want my algorithm to do this. But you see what I'm doing here? That's a linear differential equation. It converges, right? You can solve it. All right. Well, you can you can apply the chain rule, and you get an algorithm. 
<laughs> okay, and that's there's something that's called zap q learning. It turns out that that's exactly we didn't that wasn't our intention in the beginning, but later on we realized that's all we were doing. It was we were saying let's let's force this thing to be a linear system. So that's an example of designing the dynamics so you get what you want, and then you go through and you do this business. You know, you go through and you and you choose a game. I'm not really promoting this necessarily, but an example is if you t if you take a gain of a, a constant over n plus one, which is a standard thing that's proposed by Robinson Monroe, then you get this one over n mean square. I mean, not, I mean, um, what, I mean, you get this uh, convergence rate um, if this matrix is Hurwitz, uh, where this is the linearization of the dynamics. Okay, um, and that's automatic for Zap. The thing I mentioned in the last last slide. All right, and that's the thing. So you have to crank up the gain in order to get this fast rate of convergence, and Q learning fails that test. So that's one of the reasons Q learning is so slow is it completely fails that test. Okay. Um, all right, and uh, what's really cool though is that if it's Hurwitz. You can actually compute this covariance. It's a solution to a Lyapunov equation, and um, I won't give you any details there. But it's a, it's really beautiful. Now it's all asymptotic. You know, I can't give any precise error bounds, but you can't do that for Monte Carlo anyway. Like if you want to simulate a Markov chain, and somebody wants a, a finite end bound, believe me, you can't get one. <laughs> it has to be a really trivial, trivial problem if you want to find it and bound on performance. So, um, so you're stuck with sort of this sort of asymptotic statistics. All right, all right, so that's all I want to say about stochastic approximation. It's an absolutely beautiful theory. Convergence theory is sort of trivial. Um, proving this in the central limit theorem is a bit less trivial, um, but, uh, but, but not so bad. All right, okay. All right. All right, so now the quasi thing, you can imagine what I'm going to do. I'm going to get rid of the noise and make it deterministic. Um, and, uh, and let's do that. So um, again, in a lot of the applications of interest, like in, in reinforcement learning, we create the noise. And there may be exogenous noise. So there may be, in finance, there's exogenous noise. <laughs> But in most, they're not that significant. I really isn't. I mean, really, you know, control in 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 control, we typically ignore disturbances. We pretend they're not there, and we design a control algorithm so it's so robust the noise disappears by feedback. And I think people make too big a deal about, about modeling sometimes. Um, so let's pretend our systems are deterministic, and then we create all the noise, and we'll get a, a much more fast, much quicker learning uh, if we do that, as I'll show you. So, uh, so I'm my uh, in finance, I'm dead. Okay, I can't help you. <laughs> <laughs> but in a lot of other applications, we're going to create all the noise and let's do it in a smart way so we get faster learning. Okay. All right. So again, why would we settle for this crappy convergence rate? That is really bad. You know, it basically it's a one over square root of n convergence rate because of the square here. You know, um, that's a that's not a good convergence rate. And so what we want to do is actually get a much faster rate of uh, 1 over n squared. And that's really easy to do if you do things right. And again, the same procedure. Um, we're going to design, like I, I'm just repeating what I said before. We're going to design an ODE so we get convergence and all of that. Um, and then we're going to do the same thing by um, sticking in noise here. But now this is going to be like a, a mixture of sinusoids or something. So no more IED anything. And then, of course, then you have to translate from continuous time to discrete time. 
And I'm convinced now you should stay in continuous time as long as you can. Okay, get a get a um, an in, get a somebody who's an expert in numerical analysis to help you do the translation. But stay in continuous time because you can get really beautiful properties, and then if you're really smart, you can preserve those properties in a translation. And see work by Jordan and Boyd. On um, on this, you know, for optimization. You know, basically they discovered that if you are really clever about a, a discrete time translation of continuous time gradient descent, you will recover some of the acceleration techniques by Nesterov and by uh, Polyak. And it's uh, you know, if we just stayed in continuous time, we would have saved a lot of effort. I see a question there. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, I'll definitely share the slides. I'll, I'll, I'll share the slides with the scribbles uh, uh, later. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, so a canonical choice is going to be a mixture of sinusoids. Um, and it's easier to write this as complex exponentials. I'll explain why. Um, but the thing that I'm going to exploit is all of these partial integrals like this are bound in time is a property I'm going to need. Um, and I'll, uh, if I have time, I'll explain why. Okay. All right. But the, the, the generalization is that my noise is generated by dynamical system itself. So it's, it's Markovian. <laughs> this is a state space model is a deterministic Markov chain, Markov process. Um, and, uh, and this thing evolves on a compact set and, and blah, 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 blah. But that's the sort of the general setting that I'm thinking about. With this setting, I can get really crisp analysis. But, but, th but just think about this forever. I'll stick to this in, in this lecture. You know, just, we'll just stick in a bunch of sine waves uh, for, our, for our noise. All right. Um, and so basically, um, we're going to assume that there's a ergodic limit. Well, there is basically under really general conditions. Um, if, like for example, this always has an invariant measure you can prove. If it's unique, then you'll typically get this. Um, but, uh, but I need more. I need more properties than that, as we'll see. Okay, so even though this is a deterministic system, we still have a law of large numbers. All right? And that's what quasi Monte Carlo is all about. Um, yep. Okay. Now here's a funny thing. I don't know. I'm getting scared now. Remember I said I, I want a lot of partial integrals to be bounded? How can I ensure that in a general framework? Well, there's something called Poisson's equation that comes up in the theory of Markov chain, chains. You know, so all the central limit theorem, theory I was talking about earlier, uh, rates of convergence, stochastic approximation, they're all based on Poisson's equation, all of it. And uh, this is Poisson's equation for a deterministic system. So stare at that for a minute. So what happens, you give me a function g, right? I look at g of the state process at time t. I subtract off the mean, so I get something that's zero mean. So I know this divided by, you know, the time interval goes to zero as the time interval goes to infinity. Under general conditions, you can say more. You can say that this partial integral is actually bounded, and you can identify the bound. It's actually a difference of this, this, uh, these g hats. You know, so uh, for complex exponentials, you can write down a solution. It's very, very trivial to write down the form of g hat, um, and uh, in general, it's an open problem. This some, some theory there. I don't need to compute g hat. I just need it to exist. For the theory, this for the theory, just so I can have these crisp uh, convergence rate results. All right. for, for certain Gs, it'll come up. Okay. Um, yeah, for, yeah. So basically, I want to get this optimal rate of convergence in these ergodic theorems and, and, and um, quasi stochastic approximation. All right. 
Okay, so let's apply this. So I, I don't know if I'll have time to say much about theory except for give you a theorem. But let, let me just show you how pretty this is. And when I gave this um, talk at uh, Berkeley, I didn't have this pretty example. So um, let's replace it now. Much better example. I can't cover that up, it's too bad. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, so basically the goal is that I've got some loss function like this, it's not necessarily convex, and I don't know much about it. Um, I just can, I can put an input and observe an output I don't know the function, so I can only uh, observe input-output uh, measurements. And an example I mentioned that I think is really fun is a wind farm, where I can adjust the pitch of the blades on the turbines. I can uh, the, the, the their angles. I can adjust the pitch of the of the blades. You know, and then I once I do that, I can observe the power output from the wind farm. I don't have a model for this. I could just observe the input-output behavior. There's no way I have a gradient. Um, and basically, I just want to pump in sine waves, and then I want my estimates to go around and buzz around and go to the global minimum. And uh, that doesn't look like I've converged, but I'll explain to you. Yes, it does. Um, that's how I'll explain. Okay, so um, in the stochastic case, um, there's a, the Kiefer Wolfowitz um, uh, algorithm. And as this simple uh, formulation is due to actually spall, I should say. Um, so spall has sequences of simplifications of the Kiefer-Wolfowitz procedure. But if you just go and look at a, uh, a, um, a Taylor series expansion here, um, you can see that when you do a Taylor series expansion of L here and L here, the first sort of terms, um, I mean, you, the, the zeroth order terms cancel out. You know, you know this, this is approximately equal to L of theta, of theta n plus epsilon grad L of theta n times W n plus one. And here it's the same thing. except I have to make one change because it's a minus sign. Right. And so the, the zeroth order terms cancel out and you're left with something that looks like, and I'm dividing by one over two epsilon. So I, I get something that looks like a gradient descent. Okay. So um, this is an example of, um, this is an example I mean, of an OD design really. Yeah. Um, and so the thing is that you know, when people try this out, it doesn't work very well because the variance is insanely large. You know, and I'll show you examples where it just blows up. The variance is so large. Um, but when you when you put in these controlled sine waves, it's just incredible how much uh, more controlled it is. Right. Um, yeah, so there it is. I mean, you can actually, if you've got three derivatives, you can get a really, really tight, tight bound uh, on this uh, on this quantity. Um, all right. So, um, so you've got we've got our ODE, and it's not exactly gradient descent. I get a noise covariance here that comes up. Um, the noise covariance comes because I've got a W there, which multiplies the W there. So I get it with a W W transpose when I do the Taylor series, and then you get something that's of order epsilon squared. All right. Um, so it's not exact gradient descent. Now, of course, you can let epsilon decay with time if you want to. It depends on how, how much you care about, you know, very crisp accuracy. Okay, now, there's this incredible theory that, that, that I think the people who did this extreme seeking control were oblivious 
at first to Kiefer Wolfowitz. And you can see works by Kristich and others. I won't go through and make a list. You can see it here. Where they come up with these wild block diagrams, all in continuous time. Where they put an exploration signal, they put it through a high pass filter, and examples is pure differentiation. Um, and then they, they take their loss function L, put it through a high, same high pass filter, multiply them together. That's very much like what I was talking about. Um, and this is the gain that I, I have there before. And so you end up with a differential equation that looks just like what I was showing before. We have an, an approximate random gradient approximation there. Um, and that's called extreme seeking control. And I found out this summer they claim that the origin of this theory was 1920. And it was done by a French railway engineer. And I spent a month trying to verify that claim. And there is a patent from the 20s um, where there's something like this. And I think they're kind of right. But there's no theory. It's just a patent that never worked out. <laughs> um, but still, there's a there's a uh, still significant history here. But this turns out to be very very similar to what I'm talking about. Um, yeah. All right. Um, so you know, it, so there's nothing new here. So all I'm saying is, get rid of the noise. That's it. You know, duh. <laughs> you know, of course. I mean, so I'm I'm not saying anything novel here. I mean, just saying this this causes a lot of variance. This doesn't. <laughs> you know, some some peaceful little sine waves aren't gonna aren't gonna blow things up in the same way. You can control things a lot lot easier, um, and uh, and we can get some really elegant theory for this. Um, and this is sort of a um, a really boring example. Um, the uh, let's go back to this other example. For this example here, in fact, what I'm going to do. What I'm going to do here is this. It's just worth stopping for a second. What was, what was done here was a little bit different. I'm sorry, this is a little bit hard to see. Um, but um, it was actually theta dot equals um, minus CT um, L, I'll put a T there, theta T plus epsilon um, CT, and I forgot my gains. Um, that where CT was zero mean. And this is a really useful algorithm because it only requires one function evaluation. We'll see for reinforcement learning that's really useful. And this is also a generalization of a small, small did this for the stochastic case. So Spall Spall really was a hero in this area. So I'm just repeating his algorithm, but in, in continuous time with sinusoidal noise instead of IID. And the theory is much much uh, more accessible and much better. Okay, um, that's what I'm going to convince you. All right, let's go back. So what do I also want to say? I mean, um, I wish I wish I wish we had two hours. I'm just going to give you a statement. Um, 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 hold on a second. I don't want to give you the, hold on a second. But I'll just say one thing. You can so easily get a, um, an ODE for the scaled error. So you basically, you, for analysis, you look at the, Differential equation preserving the gain here um, for the average system, and then you compare that with the 
the uh, stochastic, quasi stochastic approximation algorithm you have, and then you divide by one over the gain, you get a beautiful OD for ZT. You know, in the stochastic case, it's a mess. Something very similar happens, but it's pages and pages and pages of analysis. I mean, you can't believe how complicated it is. But in the continuous time framework, it's like really simple. And, um, but I, I can't go through it all. You do some calculus. <laughs> and you get this amazing conclusion um, that, um, that uh, if you take this uh, one over t, one over, one over one plus t to the row gain, and let's take row less than one as the simplest uh, result. It turns out that you get this, that um, the, the, the estimate at time t is exactly, oops, the estimate at time t is exactly what you want it to be, plus at times some constant, which is so mysterious, I don't understand at all. It's often zero, but it's some funky, crazy thing. Uh, and then plus this integral of the noise I talked about. So basically, it's this thing that involves Poisson's equation, you know, which I, I briefly went over. I don't expect you to understand this, but this is a zero mean oscillatory signal, you know, and then and then something which is small, and you can quantify that, you know, roughly, um, and uh, and that's it. And all we need is that a linearization is Hurwitz. A star is nothing but the linearization at the origin. And you can always want that anyway. You want you want it to be locally uh, stable. So you want that linearization to be Hurwitz. It means all the eigenvalues in the left half plane. Okay. So this is insanely stronger than what you get for stochastic approximation and insanely easy to prove in comparison. So I'm really excited about this. This result is um, a few months old. It's only, like, it, it was born in August or something, um, the full result. Okay, so forget all this stuff. I think that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so Let's let's jump to apply. I just want to show you how we can apply this to reinforcement learning. Um, okay, so we just jump. No, yes. Anybody screaming at me? Keep going. Okay. So, this, so here's the thing. So here, this is like a two-hour lecture on history. Um, I mean, really, I was just basically trying to explain this huge history of, of uh, policy gradients, methods, and control, and sort of the origins in Markov chain theory. Um, you know, this is basically, this was a crash course for newcomers in the area. Um, and basically, this is a nice uh, conclusion for today. Okay, so let's, let's just jump to that. And, uh, oh yeah, here's a picture from the patent application, <laughs> you know. So uh, I'll let you read that later. <laughs> so it's um, yeah, 1922, there it is. That's the extreme seeking, excuse me, extreme seeking control. Okay, so now I'll explain this thing here. Um, so um, basically, um, this is a comparison of what you get using stochastic, uh, um, uh, methods, and here's what, you know, and, and what you'll get with uh, non-stochastic. Oh, no, I'm sorry, this is all deterministic. You'll see. Never mind. I'll explain in a moment. Okay, so this is basically a famous example of reinforcement learning. We have a, a um, rich, this is rich, it's rich Sutton. I was just sort of making a joke there. This is a famous example of his where you have an automobile that wants to go to the top of a hill, but it's got a weak engine. So if it, go, if it goes full speed, it's gonna stall, and all it could do is then go in reverse at full speed and go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until it reaches the top. And 
the optimal control problem of getting to the top in minimal time, the value function turns out to be very exotic. It's very non-smooth and, and stuff. So it makes uh, reinforcement learning a bit of a challenge. So it's a good example. It's very similar to the swing off of the inverted pendulum. It's almost the same thing, but it's a famous example. And um, so here's just an example policy where you, um, um, you know, basically a policy, you know, um, so I've got a, I've got an input. You know, so plus one means that I accel accelerate to the right. Um, and minus one means you go the other way. So you can imagine most of the time you want to accelerate to your goal, but sometimes you have to reverse and go the other direction. Um, and so basically this policy um, is basically has U of K is equal to, um, it's equal to one Let's call the horizontal position one. So if we're far, far away from the goal, we just head towards the goal. <laughs> um, and it's equal to the sign of, it's equal to the current velocity. I mean, it's the sign of the current velocity. Ah. Okay, so if you're far from the goal, then you accelerate towards the goal, and uh, otherwise you just go with the flow. Whatever direction you go in, you try to accelerate in that direction as fast as you can. Now, it wouldn't make sense in this example because you could get stuck over here or something like that, but in, in Sutton's example, he truncates the thing, so he, he, that's his, that, that's the, um, um, the uh, he, he constrains to just to one hill. Okay, so there's the example, and there's my policy. And this is just a simple example. It's not this wasn't carefully cooked up. It's just an example where I have a parameterized family of policies, and I can use my exam my my theory that back there to try to get to try to optimize. All right, so the goal again is to minimize the time to, to get to the destination, which is what we'll call J of X. Um, but actually, some of these policies could be unstable. Um, if I don't, if my fate is not chosen correctly, what will happen is I'll get stuck, you know. And uh, so what you end up, end up doing just to make things finite is look at the average um, t uh, loss, but take a minimum. So we don't want infinite values. That would be awful. Um, and so what I want to do is two sources of randomness I'm going to use. One is that I want to randomize over initial conditions um, because I want, it, um, I want, ex I want an expected. Um, so what I've got here is See, x here is the initial condition. So I'm looking at j, is, j of x is the time to reach the goal from initial condition x. But I don't care about just one x. So I'm going to look at the expected loss uh, over you know, some distribution of initial conditions. Um, oh, yeah, that's it here really clearly. Um, and, we, and we're doing this by choice. You know, and we don't care that much about the exact distribution of these initial guys. Um, and so basically we have a double, we have a little bit more than our quasi um, graded descent, you know, um, because we have randomness from two sources. We have, um, we have quasi randomness that 
1 is from JX0. And 2 is our quasi gradient descent. You know, this, uh, we're calling this QSQD for quasi stochastic gradient descent, what I described in the last, uh, last part of the talk. Um, and so that's going to have its own CT as well. We call it say, CTX. So you'll, you'll have basically sinusoidal choices for that. Now, this is a batch method though. So what you have to do is, um, you have to, for every theta, you have to wait until you reach the goal and collect an observation of a loss. So you can, you're not really working continuously. You know, it's really a, inherently a discrete time, time algorithm. Um, and um, yeah, um, and really, uh, and the experiments that we've done, we, we jumped straight to this, you know. We didn't do anything clever with Runga Kuta. We just went straight to, to an Euler scheme, all right. And then I'll just show you a few examples. Um, I don't need to give you the model. It's just, this is, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, so these are the two, two um, algorithms I've showed you before. Um, th this is the one, yeah, so, this is the only example I showed you in the beginning, and I briefly scribbled this one as well. These are two, two possible algorithms. Why do I like this algorithm much more than this one? Is because this requires two evaluations. And if my evaluations are noisy, then my first returns won't cancel out, I could get into trouble. Having just one evaluation is really helpful if you're worried about noisy measurements. Okay. Now the problem with this, I say recall, I didn't have a chance to say it in this lecture, it's not Lipschitz. Which is crucial in, in a theory of stochastic approximation and all this stuff. But so what you have to do is just project. You have to. So if you don't project your estimates, you'll have, it'll blow up. You know, or the schemes don't work. Or you need a clever numerical analyst to use a better, uh, a, a, um, better rule for approximating the ODE. Right. Okay, so, um, yeah, that's not, I'm, I'm gonna skip this. So here's what happens. So if you look at the, um, um, at this algorithm 1A, and you do a bunch of tests, you'll see it's the, this is a very short run. This is only um, 5,000 5, samples. Steps. That's a very short run in the world of, of uh, stochastic approximation. Well, it looks sort of like I failed. I'm doing these independent runs and I'm getting noise, right? Every time I run it, I'm getting a different answer. But if you zoom in, first of all, it's completely deterministically locked in this interval. I have no idea why. But secondly, this is the truth. That light blue thing is the actual loss function that I'm trying to minimize. So I, I, by Monte Carlo, I computed the actual function of theta. I computed this loss function, right? And I'm right in the valley. So all these theta values are almost the same. So I've, I've solved the problem, all right? Now, if you, do, if you do a really nice IID noise, you get a histogram that's all over the place. <laughs> You know, and you look at these sample trajectories. These are sample trajectories. They're all over the place, you know, <laughs> and it's incredibly unreliable. And so you need, uh, you know, and, and it, it comes from the, there's two sources. One is right here, it's like one over square root of n instead of one over n. And two, the variance here is massive, you know, absolutely massive. Um, and uh, so that's why it's so slow. So it's awesome. And the, the two observation algorithm is much better than one, you know. 
Um, I found I had to increase, you know, double the gain um, to make it really extremely amazing. It's a bit slower, but this requires two observations again. It's, it's, it's this one here. Um, it requires two observations. So if you you had noisy measurements, it wouldn't work so well. You'd have a problem. You know, it would, you'd have a you'd, it would create a bias. All right. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah. So what do I say now? I think I should skip conclusions and just go to questions because you I've I've been concluding throughout the entire lecture. So I'm just going to forego the conclusions. And um, and you can uh, uh, find references. Well, if you have, if you need references, let me know, and I can I can give them to you. There's only one thing here. Just um, this is a book I mentioned. So that's what I promised Cambridge. So, the, so this book will be available. And they, they maybe change the title. All right, so any questions? Oh, uh, thank you, Professor Main, for the great lecture. And okay. so there's a question in the, uh, in the Q&A function uh, from Steve Elton, Elston. The question is, is there any particular reason the basis function must only be sinuous? And oh, could some oh, other basis set to work to solve yeah, the yeah, stochastic? Yeah. No, so the theory um, is all based on this assumption here. Um, where is it? Oh, damn it. Right here. Right there. So the, in, in our paper, but by the way, we only uploaded this to archive a few weeks ago. Um, the assumption we make in order to get these crisp results is it that the uh, that the ex exploration signal, if you like, evolves according to a state space model. And the reason for that is because then we have theory to justify the ergodic theorem. Number one. And number two, we have theory to justify solutions to these Poisson equations. Um, and we take G, you know, you know, G of C ends up being like our F of, um, you know, a theta comma C. That's that, that's our application. That's how it's applied. So that's it. So sine waves are just easy for people to understand. That's all. Mm -hmm. um, also, but also I don't have much theory for this. I don't know for general dynamical systems um, when I can be assured there's a solution to Poisson's equation. You know, it's... Um, I have lots of theory for Markov chains in the stochastic setting. There's a really, really rich theory there, but um, it's fun, fun to think of. Um, it, it'll all come down to the output of exponents, I think. <laughs> um, I don't know, yeah, actually, I shouldn't have said that. I'm not sure what the best approach will be. Yeah. Um, all, everything, well, no, any, everything, no. You give me a criteria and we can solve it. So um, I gave you a total cost for the mountain car example. It was discounted. You get another um, root finding problem. Average cost, another root finding problem. You give me an objective. You can use these techniques. You know, it's uh, it's completely generic. You know, that's uh, that's one thing that's fun. And I, I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to make that clear enough. Um, if you go back to the to Simon's tutorial. I spend more time, you know, uh, laying out how you can apply this to any, any criteria. Um, yeah. Thank you, thank you. And another question is regarding on the, uh, on the non-stochastic, non-stochastic, uh, quasi-stochastic approximation. So what kind of assumption do you pose on the function f bar or f? And yeah. Such uh, that there's right. a unique... So, uh, yeah, all of that. Yeah, so um, 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 what if I have it here? So the assumptions. So um, so the assumptions are 
you know, one is at F bar and um, F So you really need this. I mean, global, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, consider everything's everything's bounded. You know, maybe you can maybe you can relax that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and then two, I need uh, theta dot equals um, f bar of theta to be globally asymptotically stable. Mm -hmm. You know, so theta t does go to theta star. And the third is that uh, what I call A star is Hurwitz. That's it. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, um, so that's pretty minimal. And then we get these really sharp results. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I, I don't know, I'm really excited about that. Um, so you know. In reference to the second the second condition, is it possible to slightly relax it by allowing the equilibrium to be a set instead of a single oh, yeah. point? Yeah, I I I um oh, I mean, there's no question that if you go, yes, yes. So go and see you know, like um, both Ben Aim's work and Burkhardt's book. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know. uh and I should write this Borkar 2021 because he's writing a new edition of it. Um, but they have anything you want, you know, <laughs> as long as theta t is bounded, you know, theta t converges to theta, what was it, the largest, the smallest transitive variant, blah, blah, blah set. I mean, <laughs> they, they characterize the set. And so that's, that's done in the stochastic case, and I'll bet that the, the results carry over to the deterministic case without, mm -hmm. without much work. Yeah, I know stochastic makes a difference because, oh, um, oh my God, that's so funny. Um, so, so first of all, stochastic is so much harder um, because there's a tightness results are so difficult to establish and so on all that to get these sorts of results. Um, you know, the, in the deterministic case, it's just all a bunch of really simple calculus. It's really just using Belvin Granville lemma a few times and stuff. In stochastic case for, for rates, it's much harder. And this business about sample complexity, I hate to say it, I don't want to be defensive, but that's another sort of ongoing fight I've been having with the computer science community for the last decade. Every time I write a paper, I'm asked, why don't you give sample complexity results? And I think there's a misconception in the CS community. And I'm sorry, I'm not scolding anyone, okay? I'm just saying that, I mean, you know, just, just let me be on a soapbox for a moment. You know, everybody wants a sample complexity result, but let me give you an example. Just think about a, an MM1 cube. You know, and then alpha is is less than a half, right? It's it's geometrically exotic. It's reversible, reversible. It's everything you could want, right? And then can I get a sample complexity bound? What's the probability that one over M summation K equals one to N, uh, X K greater than equal to the mean of X um, plus epsilon, right? No way, <laughs> so, you know, no way. I mean, so it's, uh, 
you know, you can get a sample complexity for the sum. <laughs> um, it, um, oh boy, how do I say this? Um, it turns out, um, first of all, it's so surprising what happens. It turns out that if you, if you let me rewrite this. Let's look at the asymptotic case first. The normal thing you do is you take a limit as, as n goes to infinity, one over n times a log. You know, well that goes to zero. And it turns out you have to put in a n squared. <laughs> and that turns out to be equal to some rate function. Can you believe that? So the thing is that people in computer science have all this intuition from fabric chervenakis theory, which is all ID. Then they have intuition about the work on finite states as Markov chains, for which there are some finite sample complexity bounds, but they're very loose. But you get to something like an MM1Q, which is so simple, everything goes out the window. You know, and you can say, well, professor of mine, I'm going to truncate. It's a finite state based model. Well, guess what? You'll get a bound that's so ridiculously coarse. It's absurd <laughs> if you want to find an bound. And so Peter Glenn at this uh, uh, Simons gave a tutorial on simulation and he said the same thing independently of me. You know, for Markov chains, you, the sample complexity bounds are typically so loose and the CLT is actually very informative. So those are fighting words to CS, and I'm sorry, but Peter Glenn backs me up, and he's worked on simulation his whole life. It's a beautiful book on the topic. He says that getting finite end bounds is completely dismissed as impossible in simulation. And if it's impossible in simulation, how can we expect it in non-trivial reinforcement learning problems? I mean non-trivial, like if your driving noise is a cube. You know, I'm trying to do RL, and the driving noise is a cue because I'm trying to optimize a network. I know I'm in trouble just for Monte Carlo, so I'm completely screwed uh, for, for TD learning. Now, CLT works fine. It's just the large deviations that fails completely, All right? So, I, uh, so there's no way to get sample complexity bounds. It's, just, it's, not, it's actually not feasible in the generality I'm talking about. Um, I, I wish there was something like that in the deterministic case. Um, maybe it's possible. If everything's sine waves, maybe you can get finite T bounds. Um, that would be a fun question to try to answer. Mm -hmm. So to yeah. follow up on that, do you think it's promising to consider finite time, finite sample, uh, finite sample bounds for the convergence of CLT in in, in Markov chains? If that's what that's what I'm saying. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Um, um, it's like a barrier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. That is a dream for me. Yes, yes, yes. So a dream, exactly. That's my dream. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, if some sub sort, yes, 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 yes. I, it may be possible. You know, it, I, I don't know how what it would look like yet. I, I, I really struggle with that. Um, um, but I, I do, I do think there's some hope there, yeah. Because these kind of examples I'm talking about don't rule it out at all, you know. Um, yeah, that would be so beautiful. I wish somebody would solve that for us. Okay, okay. thank you. And maybe uh, we have time for the last question. I was wondering whether your framework can be further extended to the two times scale stochastic approximation. Yeah, 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 please. I, I, uh, I haven't gotten to that yet. Somebody, so I'd be happy if somebody else does it for me. Uh, it, it's needed, <laughs> it's, definitely, it's definitely needed. Um, and I bet that it's a, it's a wonderful exercise to, to train some graduate student on, on, the, uh, on this theory. Um, Cause I'm sure that it's, I'm sure you could just take the, you could pick up Vivek Borkar's book Mm -hmm. and just translate every step into the deterministic case, and I bet it's just done, you know? 
Uh, so it's it's a great it's great for somebody. Somebody needs to do it. <laughs> I don't know if I'll have time, so somebody else should do that. Uh, I'm sure it's I'm sure it's uh, it's easier than the stochastic case. Uh, well, uh, but do you think it will cause trouble if we need to do pr projection? Oh, I, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't. I, I think that you can. Oh, I know that projection can can cause problems. Yes, that's true. Um, we know that with projected ODEs, you can destroy stability. Mm -hmm. So there, oh, excuse me. There, so that, yes, you're right. There is that potential. So you have to be careful with projection. I agree. Um, and um, and that's sort of a that's a that's a big numerical analyst compu computer engineering thing. You know, I mean, because you know, I mean, to construct a projection that preserves stability requires a lot of information. You've got to have a Lyapunov function, all sorts of things, and project in the right direction. It's way too complex for this. So my only hope is a hack, <laughs> you know, just to, um, uh, yeah. I think the bigger, bigger challenge, which is fun, is high dimensions. Because if you go have high dimensions, there's no way I'm gonna have a million sine waves, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so you probably would use batch methods like they do in optimization. And it might be nice to, because there, there, there's some analysis possible. Um, oh, Jesus. Yeah. I see. So, so I'm running out of the questions. So basically, uh, maybe let's uh, stop here. And thank you, Professor May, for the great talk. Yeah, it's my pleasure. And we are looking yeah. forward to seeing you guys next week. Okay, so I'll go in the. Hi, Niao. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll go ahead and send you the slides right now, too. So. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. 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 Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.